Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. You can't really excuse other stuff just because, wow, they tried. Listen, man, I, I really like this film. I think this is the last great swashbuckling film. Quite arguably the best filmmaker of our generation. And then they like it and they tell their friends and it kind of balloons from there. But when you're... Do free plugs during the show? Let's do a video game. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's probably true. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Field. And I'm Mike Butler. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it's because a more popular movie came out at the same time, or the movie we're talking about simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie, or perhaps don't love about it, and decide whether the movie is worth a revisit, which pretty much it always is worth a revisit. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to us right now. So before we get into this week's movies, how you doing, Mike? I'm doing all right. How you doing? All right. Let's get into this week's movie. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to be talking about the 1998 swashbuckling adventure, The Mask of Zorro. Oh, yeah. So for people that know much about this movie, uh, it stars Anthony Hopkins, Antonio Banderas, Catherine Zeta-Jones. And basically, it's a continuation of the Zorro saga. It picks up kind of where the old movies and TV shows left off. You've got Don Diego de la Vega, who has just returned from saving his people from Don Rafael Montero, who seeks to draw Zorro out by sacrificing regular town folk um, in order to stop Zorro for the final time before he leaves as Spanish. Uh, the Spaniards are getting, they're leaving California, which at this point is part of the Mexican government, and going back to Spain, giving the the land back to Mexico. So this is his last chance to get Zorro. He's unable to stop him, but he wounds him and kind of figures out who Zorro is, goes to uh, Anthony Hopkins, Don, De uh, Don Diego's home, and once he's there, confronts him, reveals him as Zorro, kills his wife, or accidentally. doesn't accidentally kills his wife, <laughs> who he also loves, and because he loved her, Esperanza. He, uh, Don Rafael steals Diego's baby, sends Diego to jail for life, so that he will always know that his mortal enemy is taking care of his child and will never know Don Diego. And then we fast forward probably 20 years and Antonio Banderas' character, Alejandro Murrieta, Murrieta, Murrieta. Uh, is a thief along with his brother. And he gets caught and his brother gets killed. Seeking vengeance, Antonio uh, Alejandro ends up meeting an escaped Don Diego who decides to take him under his wing and train him to be the new Zorro so that he can stop a new plot to kind of take California back from Spain by using slave labor and also stop Don Rafael, who has returned to California. And thereby, Don Diego can finally enact his vengeance and reveal himself to his daughter and say, hey... I've taken back what's rightfully mine. So basically, it's a changing of the guard. This movie. Well done. I think uh, well, Don Rafael Montero is trying to buy back, he's trying to buy he's California's buy California. independence with gold that he that is Santa Ana's gold that he discovers. Yes, yes, uh, he's uh, mining with slave labor. Yes, and great, yes. absolutely. So obviously, this is clearly before California became part of the United States. <laughs> Uh, okay, so just quick facts, because um, I've heard from a couple people that they actually like when I we talk about when this movie was released, like when movies are released and when like what was out around that time. So I, I doubled down on that. To this Ooh, well, I, all right. I, 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 I didn't really double down. I just kind of. <laughs> so this movie was released on July 17th, 1998 in the heart of summer. Now, I, I mean, I think we're talking about it being forgotten in terms of just not. Because it was successful because it spawned a sequel, The Legend of Zorro. It just it took a long time to get it. Correct. But it, it was still it was still popular. It made money. Right. Which we'll get into. So but just kind of like the season of 1998 when it came out. Uh, so the fifth. So this that's a 17th was a Friday on the Wednesday, the 15th. You had there's something about Mary that came out, which was a huge, huge. It's probably the Fairly Brothers biggest movie. If you haven't seen there's something about Mary, you should. It's really funny. The week after, July 24th, you had a, a plethora of movies. You had Disturbing Behavior, the Katie Holmes uh, pod people type movie, which mm -hmm. I actually like. 
And I actually put it on our list. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Mafia, which is, eh, it's kind of like a naked gun. Uh, oh, I have thing with Jay Moore. I, I remember it, that. It's got some funny stuff. It, it's not as good as the other ones. Uh, and then a couple, you had, you had Billy's Hollywood Screen Kiss and the Lido. Those were like, that. In the, those were like uh, limited releases. They didn't really do that. But you also had Saving Private Ryan, which I was surprised that I forgot that it was a summer movie. I thought Saving Private Ryan was in the fall or holiday season, but that was a July 24th release. Hmm. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that movie before, What's, but it was pretty popular. Is that, uh, is that that one with the... Uh... <laughs> It's one with um, Ben Affleck and Matt it, Damon. No, or... it, it's the one. It's it's, <laughs> it's the one with uh, I can't even say it. It's the one with the uh, Toretto from Fast and Furious franchise. Oh, <laughs> so it's all about family. Exactly. Um, you also had the now the week before this movie came out. The week before Mask of Zorro came out, July tenth. You had Lethal Weapon four and Small Soldiers, which I forgot the lethal, about Lethal Weapon four, uh, which was pretty popular, and Small Soldiers, which I like. And then before that, on July 1st, you had Armageddon, which was a huge movie. Yes. So the month of July in 1998 is pretty packed with 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 decent films. I, mean, I saw all those movies, pretty much all those good movies for you. in the theater. Good for you. My parents spent a lot of money on me that day. Well, <laughs> good for you. So, yeah, so it came out in a really busy, busy time, which is surprising because it was originally planned to be released uh, December 19th, 1997, and then got pushed to March 98 and all this was it, the reason. And then obviously it got pushed to July. I think basically because of shooting delays and production delays and stuff like that. But I don't see this movie as a holiday release. I'm, no, this so, is a summer movie. I was surprised that, that it was going to be coming out in December. Like that was the plan a week before Christmas. I mean, I guess it would have done business, but I'm, it was, I, this is a summer movie. It definitely feels more of a summer movie. Absolutely. Than anything, yeah. Rated PG 13. 137 minutes, a budget of $95 million, which I don't know if that's accurate because I read that there were budgets of 60 and then it went, then it went over like $10 million. So that obviously I put that at 70. So I'm not sure if the 95 million is accurate, but it was on box office mojo.com. So I'm going to go with it. Maybe it actually includes marketing costs. Maybe that, that could be revealed at this point for that. It said production budget though, but you know what? I, we could, that could be too. I, I just, you know, I'm not really going to, I'm not going to really put my stamp of approval on that, by that <laughs> number right there. Written by John Eskow. So he wrote the original script and he had done Air America and Pink Cadillac. That's the Clint Eastwood movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually all the movies he'd done. So I don't, I don't know. This was the last movie that he got credited for writing. Yeah. Written again by Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, who, if you know who they've done, they've done like the Pirates franchise, Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, Shrek, Aladdin, the original Aladdin, the yes. 1998 Godzilla. And uh, I shook my head there. And The Lone Ranger, which I like The Lone Ranger. I know a lot of people don't like it. Uh, it's on our list. It is on the list. But there are a lot of similarities between that movie and this movie, which we can maybe get into later. I, I also kind of noted yes. the same thing. Yeah, very, like similar, just kind of like themes. I think that's also indicative of them both being based on um, 1950s kind of like horse and swordsmen. Oh, you're saying like they series. all had the same type of story? They're probably even back in the 50s. I would wonder if there was some crossover between the writers. Well, I know that I know that the, in one in our notes, like Zorro or the original tale yeah. of Zorro was something like Batman was based on. Like it was like a um right. That's why in the original Batman comic series, he's actually watching Zorro. Um, OK, that's what he leaves the theater with his parents after that's going right. to see. That's he begs right. them to come see Zorro. And they watch Zorro and then they get killed. So that was part of the inspiration. So an influence. Yeah. Inspiration. Influence for the character yeah. and the writer. Yeah. I I that, yeah. That's fine. That's cool. Directed by Martin Campbell, who has done uh, Casino Royale, which is arguably the best James Bond movie ever yeah. made. I think it's inarguably, inarguably the best James Bond I, I was trying to be made. nice. So inarguably the best James <laughs> Bond. It's not only a really, it's not only the best James Bond movie. It's a really good movie. It's actually one of my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Of all time, Butler? Of all time. Wow. It's up there with Collateral. Actually, probably uh, above well, collateral. All right, enough of collateral. I've, I've no, heard, no. Enough if you collateral. haven't watched that episode, <laughs> listen to that episode yet. I'm gonna start plugging older episodes now. So go. <laughs> um, also, he also did Golden Eye, uh, Vertical Limit. I uh, I didn't know that. I don't like vertical. You don't limit. like Vertical Limit? I, I mean, don't it's, mind it's, it. it's, Bill watch, it's watchable. Chris O'Donnell, Bill Paxton being all jerky and stealing that. Uh, what is he stealing? I don't even Not remember. Morphine. It's something. Oh, yep. Adrenaline. For those who haven't seen Vertical Limit, that's the adventure on Mount Everest, right? Is it Mount Is Everest? It Everest? Yes. I don't know. It's some mountain. I think it's Everest. It's okay. It's, it's watchable. not okay. It's, it's definitely watchable. Yeah. And then he also did Green Lantern. So, uh, God, <laughs> that I know he did. 
the domestic take in for this movie was ninety four million, which matches the budget, which is why probably why I screwed that up, but also pretty good. Yeah. Worldwide made two hundred and fifty million. Its opening weekend was twenty two and a half, which is pretty impressive when you are into uh the third day of There's Something About Mary, which is definitely, you know, a comedy, so it doesn't really match up. And then you're also after the the onslaught of Armageddon and Lethal Weapon Force, that's not that bad, twenty two and a half million. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you this question? Do you have the breakdown for what because domestic total was or international total was pretty big? Do you have what no. like uh, the Latino audience or just Mexico I in general? No, I, I don't know. I'd be interested to see that. Like how it did in Mexico? Well, yeah, because that's kind of like I, I'd imagine he'd be pretty big there as opposed to like England. I'll tell you what, as you're as you go off on one of your tangents, I will look it up as we're going <laughs> and see if I can find that. Shame on me for not preparing that. Nominated for two Academy Awards for sound and sound effects editing, and you broke down who was in the movie. Um, yeah, you mentioned Don Rafael Montero. That's he's played by uh, Stuart Wilson. Tony Amendola plays Don Luis, which he's from New Haven. Is but Tony Amendola? I is. like him. Yeah, but you know that he's also in the Legend of Zorro as a different character. He's in the second movie as See, a I di- don't, totally different character. I've watched the second movie and I really don't remember uh, much. Of I have it. watched the second movie and I've completely forgotten the rest of it. Remember, there's a train scene. I know he has a son. Well, I don't like the fact that I know in the they're second, fighting. So not that. <laughs> so in this first movie. Obviously, he captures the heart of of Elena, mm-hmm. and you know they at the end of the movie they spoiler alert. You know, I'm not doing the spoiler yeah, anymore. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, they end up together, and 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 he's telling the story to his son right. and stuff like that. But like, or his daughter, it's his son. His son, okay. But like in the Legend of Zorro, like they're broken up, and she's with some other guy. It's like I hate that. But she's not really with the other guy she's in the plot she works with the other guy but i don't think she's dating the other guy it's just Uh, that in the plot of legend of zoro they talk about how she's with this other guy she's dating another guy i I don't remember remember that i remember i remember them being kind of estranged Mm -hmm. and basically they have a working relationship her and the other guy and he kind of wants it to go further i gotcha but she's like rufus sewell but he, he plays the bad guy yeah all right so and then you talked about how alejandro marita's Banderas' character's brother gets shot. That's Joaquin Marietta. He gets killed by Captain Harrison Love, who's played by Matt Letcher. Now, did you know that Joaquin Marietta is a real person? Not Alejandro. He's fictional. But Joaquin is real. I did not the know Legend that. of the Marietta's is real. But Joaquin is supposedly what Zorro is based on. His, yes. Oh, yes. I did not know that. So I, I found that. He's a, I have his historical figure. Uh, he's rumored to be the original inspiration for the character of Zorro. Rumored. But well, now I'm going to have to look that up. So, but I thought that was one of the, in Pana revisit, that, that's all for the facts, by the way. Upon a <laughs> revisit of this, I, I, and then I was going through the notes and researching, I, I thought it was very interesting that there was a lot of stuff that was factual, like a lot of stuff that they interwove in there that I, I appreciated a little bit more this time around because I didn't know a lot about it probably when I first watched it. Um, or didn't pay attention. Cause, yeah. Because honestly, in the summer season, when all these movies are coming out and you're going week to week to see a movie, you're just like, oh, next movie, let's go see it. You're yeah, not really like yeah. sitting down and kind of like, you know, breaking it down like you would do like a movie if you went to go see something like, uh, you know, like Schindler's List during the holiday season. You're like, oh my God, that's such a heavy handed movie that you sit down and you have to, you know, kind of like work Contemplate through it. it. Right. Yeah, right. And talk about yep. it. This movie is summer movie, just in and out, in and out, in and out. You're seeing right. movies constantly. Yeah. At least for people like us who are always seeing movies. Yeah. So yeah, so that's uh, like I said, I broke down the facts. Um, did you did you want to start off at a certain point or? I don't know. Well, did you know that Matt uh, Lesher actually plays? I knew Reverse you were going. Flash I, I already the, knew you were going the there. Cause I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're a fan of the series Flash that's out now and you haven't seen Mask of Zorro yet, maybe you should go back and watch Mask of Zorro. Well, I should tell you that He's I am, actually very good in that. I have no idea who what, what a reverse Flash is. It's his main bad guy. He wears the reverse colors. <laughs> That's why Get he's it? reverse. Is he from a different universe? He's from the future, and he hates the Flash because he could never beat the Flash. How, does he, become, how does he become reverse Flash? Uh, I think he tries to redo the experiment that gives Flash his powers. And he's never able to kind of live up to the Flash and basically always screwed up. So an older Flash basically told him to quit, which kind of drove him insane because he was obsessed with him. So kind of like serial killer, like he's like, you know what, then I'm going to kill you. But he has the same abilities as Flash. Basically, yeah. What's the reverse colors? Like gold and then red, er, a red Flash symbol? Yeah, it's a yellow suit with a red Flash symbol. And he goes back in time and actually murders Barry's parents. (laughs) Jesus. So it turns out he was the guy that murdered Barry's parents. So Barry kind of causes his own parents' death. Interesting. Yeah. It's, 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 actually, it's, it's not bad. It's not bad. Maybe I can sell you on watching The Flash. Oh, God, that's like another... While we also convince the audience to watch Zorro. 
<laughs> <laughs> I think the audience should. Uh, this is a good movie. I mean, we talked about. Oh, I, you know what? I should bring up. I'm sorry. So we, I talked about who wrote it. Right. I also found out that it's um, according to the book Tales from the Script that David S. Ward rewrote 85% of the dialogue and received no credit. And it was like a big thing. And it was like they put out a, a paper for it. David S. Ward wrote the sting. He's written a lot of stuff. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah. Like, but he rewrote a lot of the dialogue. Interesting. I thought that was interesting too because I'm, I, I'm, you know, Ellie and Rossio are, are, are good writers. Yeah. So I'm surprised that I don't, I don't know. I don't know why you bring somebody in to just kind of punch it up. I would almost wonder if, you know, if they dug so deep in the history and they put the, the Morietta, uh, Joaquin Morietta and stuff like that, maybe, and obviously the California, Mexico kind mm -hmm. of relationship, maybe they made it too serious. And although the action was there, maybe the kind of comedy, you, not comedy, it's, it's definitely not like a comedy. Well, there's there's definitely there's comedic, some comedic stuff, stuff yeah. in it. Maybe that that's what he was brought Funny in to stuff. do. Yeah. That, hey, we need a little bit of a lighter tone for our summer movie, kind of a thing. I well, got gotcha. you. Didn't know it was a summer movie at that point. That's true. Too. An adventure film needs a little bit more of a lightheartedness to it. A swashbuckler, anyway. Yeah, that's true too. I don't know, but I mean, they just when was Shrek? It was probably ninety nine, two thousand. So it was a little. It was after this then. It was after this. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah, I I can see that. Did you know that? It, well, let me let me start off from the beginning. Okay. So the opening starts, and I got to read a whole paragraph of stuff, and it's not big letters. Yeah, I didn't remember how much stuff there was. I mean, I like that they introduced the history. Yeah, but yeah, it's it, too fast, and it's too. It's well, you, I I don't know if you know this. I'm sure you do, but when you put credits on screen or anything that you need to re read, you need the rule is that you need to be able to read it two times straight through. That's how long you should keep right. it on yep. there. Um, so for anyone out there who's making a movie that wants to put a something <laughs> an epilogue on your or a prologue, you have to make sure that you're reading it straight through once, straight through twice, then fade out. Because uh, I started reading it and then I was like, oh, crap, let me see if I can get through this two times. <laughs> and I couldn't, but I, I think it was still up there long enough. But it was I was like, oh, my God, what do I have to I, like? You have to like process all this. See, I've I've watched this movie many, many times. I, I really, really spoiler. I am going to kind of try to shoot down anything wrong you say about this Ooh, movie. Ooh, excellent! The most part, because I've probably seen this movie. Right. I would probably at least a dozen times, maybe more. Um, this was one of the movies when I was growing up. I would rewatch. I saw this at eleven, and I just I love this movie. All right. Um, no, I'm not saying it's no, 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 no. Like, challenge accepted. It's challenge accepted. But yeah, like if I hadn't seen it that many times, I'd be like. Because uh, even watching it now, I haven't seen it in a few years. I was just like, "That's a that's a that's a shit ton of information." It I is. A I lot. just missed. It's a lot. But it's yeah, lot. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Although I do like the next scene is the the tearing of the cloth, and you have to like you hear it and you expect, "Oh, it's Zoro." Oh, the kids. Yeah, the kids that murder people. Uh, five minutes later. Listen, they were about to kill Zoro. Uh, they were they're cheering an awful lot about murdering those guys. They saved Zoro. They don't care. They're kids. <laughs> they, and they turn out to be criminals. So, I mean, come on. <laughs> That's true, too. <laughs> I was the one when Zoro gives, uh, at that point, it's, it's Joaquin, when he gives him the medallion. It's like, why doesn't the other kid get one? What I like is that you, <laughs> you watching this, you assume, oh, that's got to be Antonio's character uh, later on. And it turns out that's Joaquin. That's the other brother. Yeah. yeah. So I liked that kind of reversal. You know, there is a saying, a very old saying, when the pupil is ready, the master will appear. Now, if you want to kill this man, I can help you, and I can teach you how, how to move, how to think, how to take your revenge with honor and live to celebrate it. It will take dedication. It will take time. Why are you so eager to help me? Because once, a long time ago, you did the same for me. Oh, okay, I, I can understand that. Um, did you know that Sean Connery is supposed to be uh, Zorro? Was supposed to be old, as I call him, old Zorro. Did you know that? I don't know why. Why does that bother you? It's, it's not a Spanish or Mexican person, a person of descent playing Zorro now. Because here's the thing about Sean Connery. I mean, Anthony Hopkins. Yes, he played it with kind of a. Obviously, he didn't even try to do a Spanish accent, which is fine if he well, could. Hold on, but didn't he? Did he do it in the beginning? I thought he did it in the beginning, or maybe I wasn't paying attention. Doesn't he speak in Spanish real quick in the beginning? Oh no, I, that's no, that's. Um, Don Raphael. I guy. thought he had. I thought he had some some of an accent in the opening. I'm not sure. I, I, I think he does. I think and he then puts, it obviously goes away. Yeah, he puts a little bit on it. But Sean Connery has a very distinct accent. Of course, accent as I should say. Oh, nice. And it's really hard to 
I don't think he's ever tried to hide that before. I don't know if he ever could. Even when he doing he doing um speaking in Russian. Oh, for, uh, for, in, October? for October. Yeah. You hear the the Scottish accent heavily. Yeah, but they they get around that because they're taught. I understand what you're saying, but they they basically all talk the same their original dialect in Hunt for October because they do that switch where they the guys speaking English. Uh, excuse me. Speaking Russian, they zoom in on his lips and they come back and they speak right, English. Speaking at that Russian. point, everyone's like, okay, they're really speaking Russian, but we're not going to do that. I got that. I just don't think, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, you wouldn't do that for this movie. I get that. And I'm, I'm not really giving it a negative saying that they're all speaking in the regular accents, the regular, you know. Right. I just, I could have sworn I, he was doing it in a, an affected accent in the beginning and then it was gone. And whatever. I mean, it's He's also, it also kind of shows the difference between maybe high class and the lower class mm -hmm. is like, he's got the accent. I mean, even uh, Stuart Wilson doesn't have, he kind of speaks more in. Well, he's, he's little, English too. Yeah. He's English yeah. too, but it kind of shows, okay, those are the Spaniards. Cause I believe Don Diego is supposed to be Spanish. Don and Diego. He, who are you talking about? Anthony Hopkins. Anthony character? Hop, yeah. Don, Don Diego, Diego de la Vega. He's one of the Dons, just like everybody. He's a Spaniard. He comes down, but he kind of loves the Mexican people. Uh, sure. And, and feels for their plight. Sure. So that's why he becomes Zorro. So he's, up there with the high fluting people too, even though he's, you know, a man of the people. Well, let's put it: if this movie's made now, you're not casting. Exactly, um, you're not casting. You're you're, you're getting you're get, you're also getting a lot of blowback from people. Because That's why to cast, it's the yeah. internet and all that kind of right. Thing. So, Absolutely. but I would make a case for you could do it now, and you could make Banderas the old Zorro. Absolutely, I think you should. That that'd be cool. I think that would be good. But yeah, so you're definitely gonna get a lot of blowback. Yes. for that this time. Part of my Connery note was that. So he was originally cast, but the role was originally meant for Raul Julia, who died. That would have been awesome. I would have been good. Yeah, he would have been great. Yeah. I mean, he was, we were actually just yes. talking about Street Fighter the other day. Yep. Oddly enough, I, he's definitely the best part. Like, he can take anything and make it good because he's, he doesn't mind that. It's like he hams it up. Would well, you ever see him in uh, Presumed Innocent? Yes. Yes. He's really good in that. He would make, he would have made an excellent uh, Zorro. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Speaking of Zorro. Uh, one of one of my big likes is is Antonio Banderas. Oh yeah, and one of my big one of my big likes about Antonio Banderas is no matter what he's doing, he he acts and performs with such energy. It's refreshing because it's just kind of like it's you know what I mean. It's like he's like it's not like he's going all out and he's out of control, but it's just he you can tell that he is putting so much into it and it works. It's not it's not disingenuine. I guess is that a good word? No, absolutely, right. yeah. So I really enjoy him. As, I think he was the perfect cast for Zorro. And the reason why he's Zorro is because Robert Rodriguez was supposed to direct this. And he was oh, all set. They're all their friends. This whole movie was started as of like 1992. Like they wanted, it was Spielberg was producing and Spielberg was going off and trying to get like, a, he was, who did, somebody suggested to him to, do, to use Mikhail, Mikhail Solomon, who's a cinematographer like always in Backdraft in the Abyss. And then, um, he dropped out, but he was the one that brought Connery on. I, I'm pretty sure. Maybe not. I might be wrong with that one. Then it was going to be Rodriguez, but Rodriguez wanted to do a rated R violent Zorro, oh, which of course. I mean, so now mind you that Rod Rodriguez is coming off of El Mariachi and then El Mariachi, this brought El Mariachi are pretty much, I know they're, they're a trilogy, but they're pretty much the same movie. It's essentially like it Evil it's Dead better, 1 and Evil Dead 2. Right, it's right. a better El Mariachi, just yeah. It's a better, and it's, and all with all due respect to the gentleman that played El Mariachi and El Mariachi, Antonio Banderas is it was a much better performer of that role. Absolutely. So he's hot off of that. So you know, Desperado's Radar Gunfest, which is really good. Mm -hmm. I can understand him wanting to do Radar Violent Zorro, but I don't think that this is the type of movie you wanted. That I think the studio was good, or Spielberg, whoever, to say like, eh, no, that's not what we're gonna do here with this right. movie. So I think they were smart in saying that he did. So he he dropped out. Then Martin Campbell came on. But Banderas was still part, was still in there for the role of Zorro. Oh, who wouldn't want to like, no. come on, if you're an actor and they're like, hey, this is Zorro. He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and he's definitely well cast. He's probably the, the perfect one to play Zorro at this time. And I like the fact that he wanted to he perform most of his own stunts, which I can appreciate, which. Oh, that's impressive because his, st his stunts were actually really. Well, he's also younger back then. <laughs> right. But his stunts even then, though, are, are very kind of gymnastic, very. Right. Spry type stunts that you have to do. And Martin Campbell actually turned down Tomorrow Never Dies to do this movie. So maybe you should. Uh, that's another reason you should like Zorro. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, while we're but while I'm, I keep 
being on the subject of who was in what and who turned down what, did you also know that this, the role of Elena was offered to Shakira? Would you have liked this movie? How old is Shakira? I don't know. That's I what feel it said. Like Shakira is not that old. That's what it says. And that's what I said in my, in my research. I feel like, I mean, I might've liked it. I mean, Catherine Zeta Jones though, back then was, you have to also remember that Catherine Zeta Jones is playing someone who's supposed to be 20. Well, and she would have been, and she's like she's, 28 in this 27, yeah. 28 in this. And Banderas is like 30 something in this. That's less creepy than if Shakira was probably like 18. Well, probably she probably. Yeah. Like I can't imagine Shakira's that old. Maybe like your age at the the latest. So like she would have been. Yeah, it's just it would be creepy, so creepy. <laughs> I mean, she might have done a good job, and I mean, at least it would have been someone who's Spanish. But I, when I first saw, and and so did like I've never seen her in anything until this movie. Who back then? Catherine Zeta okay, Jones is the first thing I saw her, and you know, if you didn't know who she was, and I think most people probably did not back, back then, then. No, I thought she was, you know spanish or, or latina, oh, like yeah she she looks the part she speaks the part she actually has an accent throughout the movie like i really thought okay yeah she's maybe she's spanish and then like she talks and she's english it's like wow yeah who knew i have broken the fourth commandment padre you kill somebody no that is not the fourth commandment of course not you, you in what way did you break the most sacred of commandments I dishonored my father. That is not so bad. Maybe your father deserved it. What did you say? Well, her big, I think her movie that this is her first big studio film. Right. Uh, well, actually, no, I take it back. She's in The Phantom. That, that's yeah. before Zorro? Yeah, that was The uh, Phantom was from 1996. And then she, because she got this, she was put into this movie. Uh, because Spielberg saw her in the Titanic miniseries and he liked her. And then, and then she was a mask. Cause then and what's funny is the fact that Connery, you know, Connery dropped out of this, but like her next movie is entrapment, entrapment with him, yeah, <laughs> which is not, uh, it's not great. I remember not liking that movie. Yeah. I remember liking the Phantom. I like the Phantom. Yeah. I don't mind the Phantom. It's cheesy, but it's, it is. It's, it's very similar to like, it's a swat, kind of like a swashbuckler, like old yeah, they're radio do, series heroes. They're trying to similar. do like Raiders. And right, like yeah, superhero kind of thing, yeah. They kind of mismatch. Not to be confused with Phantoms, which I actually don't mind either. That's the Ben Affleck, the Dean Coots book. Oh, yep, yeah. okay. That's okay. That, that has the famous line in Jay and Silent Bob. Is Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back when he's like, "Yo, you the bomb and Phantoms." Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's so, honestly every time I talk about Phantoms, that's the only thing I remember is that is line from Jay and Silent yeah. Bob. Which I mean, yeah, it's good stuff. All right, so since you love everything about this movie, Mike, give me something you don't like about it. Uh, well, the opening sequence where it's too long to read. Um, <laughs> I've already done that. Watching, looking back on it, the the kind of whitewashing of some of the characters, I was a little bit kind of like eh. the fact that they were like just Welsh like yeah, actors. like where was, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it was maybe it was wrong back then, but nowadays you watch and you're like, they probably should have included more. I mean, and, and the cast is there are quite a few Latino actors and actresses in this film, but when most of your main cast, save for Antonio Banderas, is a British actor. Yeah, that's that's saying something. It's it, I mean, especially uh, in 98, you think that you think that there'd be some foresight. Right. I mean, uh, you got Captain Love who is is a white guy. That makes sense. And you make him the bad guy, which is good because <clears throat> it should it, that's that it should kind of be like that. Yeah, you definitely shouldn't have a white guy in there inserted as like your hero character just because. Which 10 years prior to that, they probably would have done. Right. When you're making movies, you're only the only color that anybody ever cares about is green all only color Absolutely, they care yeah. about is 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 to make money and, and who's going to bring anthony hopkins is going to bring money into this and and is going to bring people into the seats because he's also you got to remember anthony hopkins is huge off of sounds of the lambs and he's you know he's making movies after movies and stuff like that absolutely and you want somebody who's a strong classic right. kind of actor probably i understand why you make that decision um but i also understand the sensitivity behind not making that decision right and i think now I, I I think audiences now are are more we're all more uh, aware uh, and uh, and more I sensitive to not sensitive but I mean just cultures. but I but I also think like I don't think audiences are not going to go see a movie because it's it doesn't have a certain person in there you know like like if they redid Zorro now mm -hmm. like I said and, and and it was all basically all people of Mexican descent or Spanish descent I was not going to go see the movie people are going to go see the movie because they're there for the story I mean, right. 
I think a lot of times people don't realize that or executives or the people that behind the decision making don't realize that people just want to be told a good story half the time. And, and they see something like we talk about all the time working at the theater. People come in. They're there because, you know, when people are like, oh, I can't wait to see this movie. I can't wait to see John Wick. You know, I got like old ladies coming to see John Wick. Right. You know, like because they just want good stories. And, and John Wick trilogy is, is a great story. <laughs> but, you know, I think they just it doesn't matter who's you, the movies will make the star. Nobody knew who um, nobody knew who Hugh Jackman was before he was Wolverine. And all of yeah. a sudden he's like the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, this is what happens. Yeah. So I don't I think now I think if you did a Zorro. I still think you should. Uh, you know what? They should do a Zorro now. Antonio Bader should be the older Zorro, same character, and just and just do like make it a third movie and go on from there. Well, there has been a Zorro movie in development hell for the longest time. Um, it'll end up being an Amazon Prime uh, <laughs> six <laughs> six part series. So yeah, so I think that's what. Looking back and watching all that, I agree with you. I also think that Anthony Hopkins, like I I I never like somebody who's in his he's in his sixties in this movie, mm-hmm. and when he's playing his younger self in the beginning, it's like eh, come on, I'm I'm okay with it. I mean, I'm, I'm not. With it, with his with his with his hair, they give and, him like yeah. the hair, and they color it, and they give him the mustache. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I love how gross he looks when they visit the prison, and they're looking for Zorro, and I love that prison scene. I'm Zorro. No, I'm Zorro. Yeah, Spartacus scene, yeah. yeah. And he's just like got the eye patch. I don't think they're Spartacusing. That, that's what they're doing. That's from Spartacus. I under, I understand that, but also if you look at it like from the sentence, well, that, that's like hell. Like even if they're gonna assassinate him, that's like a way out. Oh yeah, yeah get me out of here. Yeah, I'm Zorro. No, I don't think that's what they're saying. Because Zoro is still at this point still a, a person who is a symbol of, you know, independence, and yeah. a symbol of somebody who says, you know, no to the man, quote unquote. But you never really get the sense that they know that he's Zoro. They never really look at him and go like, oh, I got you. No, bro. I got you. They're just like, yeah, I'm Zoro. Like, get me out of this prison or kill me. I don't care. If any one of you is or ever was that masked man all dressed in black known as Zoro, reveal himself now. I'm Zoro! They took my mask. My sword. Silence, you old fool! I am Zoro! I am the man you want! I am the original! I am am Anyone can see you are too dope! The one thing I don't understand about that is so he, Don Raphael, gets him arrested right and then he loses track of him like they never like well because he goes he goes back to spain he hasn't been back in california for years why does he go back to spain because they're giving the country back so he's a don he's he's got power in spain he's got influence in spain he'll no longer have land they gave up all the land or he he sparsed the deeds out to certain dons but he himself was going back to spain okay because he was more part of the government okay all right okay all right so then, and he comes back just to kill him before he, he wants to kill him before he starts his plan. I think so, yeah. About, yeah. Or just to see, hey, is he still around? Yeah, just checking on my revenge. <laughs> and we had, we had a, uh, in that scene, we had a nice little uh, Maury Chaikin. Uh, I noticed that, yeah. Uh, Maury Chaikin uh, cameo, who I personally like from the Nero Wolf series. I know I've told you about this. Yes, you and have. anyone out there who has known, if you read the books, uh, Nero Wolf, the Nero Wolf books, the mystery books, um, they're great. The series is great too. The TV show they did, I can't remember what it was. Not it was A and E. That's right. I figured Timothy Hutton and and Maury Chagan plays Nero Wolf. So uh, that, I think that's that's the role I always remember him from. So yeah, so quick shout out to Nero Wolf fans. <laughs> and when I was watching the movie, I was like, oh, that's the guy. That's the guy that Mike was talking about. There you go. <laughs> so and speaking of the Dons, so when he comes back to California, he comes on the boat and he meets all the Dons, and that was Don Julio. Is that the Don Julio from the Tequila? No, so that is the <laughs> Tequila Don Julio. <laughs> There's oh, a cut scene where he actually pulls he out a bottle have, and brings yeah. it to- Hey, Don Julio, how you doing? Business is booming. He's got like the cut. <laughs> <laughs> These Patron brothers, so I really got to get them off my back. <laughs> oh, that would have been fantastic. <laughs> I love that speech, though, when uh, Don Luis comes up to him and goes, oh, so great to have you back in the country. We won't forget what you did for us. And he goes up to Mexican people go, I know you don't want to be here. It's hot. I know you got paid. These shit bags yeah. behind me have been screwing up. Yeah, they don't care about you. They've been screwing you guys over for decades. And, but like what the best part about this is then like, I think it's like 20, 30 minutes later, they're having that huge party and they're all like hanging out, having a good time. Hey, man, you may talk some bad stuff about us. Like, why are you still hanging out around here with them? Because he's got the money and he's I got guess. the influence. What else didn't you like? Because I want I want I want to hear the negatives from you. You want to hear the negatives? I mean, I Really? There aren't a lot of negatives. I get it's you. A, it's a good, it's a great. Do you think it's a little too long? 
No, and here's here's my thing. I actually wrote a note. Martin Campbell doesn't know how to do a short movie. It seems. <laughs> Uh, which is fine because Casino Royale is incredibly long, maybe too long, but I don't know if I'd cut anything out of it because Casino, Casino Royale is has, so great. It has like oh, it has like an ending in the middle of the movie. It does. You know what I mean? But like, so does the it because it kind of makes its own story and then follows sure. a novel. Yeah. And just like Casino Royale, I mean, Zorro is nowhere near as long as Casino Royale. I don't like I, I was I'm watching the movie and this is like my upteenth time watching. It. I'm still like, this is a really good movie. I, mm. I don't. I didn't get bored. I don't look at the clock. I don't look at my watch and go, oh, man, I should cut this scene. or I want to cut this. Like, I think it all flows very well. I think he knows how to cut a movie very well. Sure. Well, the well, the action set pieces are, are well done. The set piece that he does where he's where he's getting the horse. He's trying to steal the horse. Mm-hmm. And then and like he ends up blowing up half the place. Uh, that whole fight's funny. Like and Bandera is really good in that when he tries to get when he's getting the map and then they have they has the sword fight with Letcher and stuff like that. Yep. Okay, that that's good too. And then obviously, um, you know, at the mine at the end and stuff like that. So did you know um a couple of fun facts because I had the special Ooh. features. When he was trying to do the horse scene where he steals uh thunder. Yeah. And the horse or, is supposed is that to thunder raise it or a its, tornado. That oh tornado, I'm right. sorry. Yeah, um when right. he's trying to stand up on his hind legs and he's breaking the beds and all that kind of stuff. Yes. So they had a real horse. And then I guess that he had dozen, like a dozen horses, one to do each stunt in the movie, basically, Martin Campbell said. And they kept trying to get this one horse that was supposed to do this one thing. And he said, I'm very patient with animals. I was told, you know, it's going to take, you know, a, a couple dozen takes. He goes, so 50 takes in, this horse still isn't doing it. So I just said, you know, I can't do this anymore. We just have to go on. So they have the horse kind of raise up on its hind legs and they cut. And that's why. So a lot of the horse breaking up the stuff is just clever cuts okay. or basically a um one of those machines like you see the rodeo bulls basically right and uh Antonio Banderas on that and just close-ups of a horse just to cut and make it seem like he's destroying the place because this horse just kept behaving <laughs> and wouldn't go nuts nice and the uh the chase the horseback chase after he steals the map yes where it's inexplicably daytime yeah after the nighttime fight that they have in the the mansion yep which all right so there, there's a little complaint right there <laughs> it just suddenly changes time of day that was all shot. He gave a couple of notes to his second unit director, and that was all second unit shooting. The really? Fight. And he was like, I have to hand it. Like, they did a great job. Because he, he usually works with an artist that creates all the storyboards. So he knows exactly what to shoot to save money and time and stuff like that. Uh, so all his shots are, redone, are already done. But for that shoot, he just kind of gave his second unit guy, like, all right, this is kind of what I want. Second unit guy came up with everything and shot it. Really? And what I thought was cool was Martin Campbell did give him props in that document. Like, that was all him. Oh, you have to. So right. his second, which second unit, do you know? I don't know. He probably named them, but I don't remember. Uh, shame on me for not writing that down on my notes when I was watching that. So you said it was a second. I'm trying to see if, because uh, there's a bunch of, there's a second assistant director, first assistant director, second assistant director, second unit director. My second unit, if you said second unit, I believe. He said so, that's Glenn Randall Jr. So that's a, that's a good sequence. I really like that fight sequence. The the on the horseback on the horseback when he yeah. gets on two horses yeah. and he jumps over the branches. I like and, it when he spins around and to when he does the jump to get himself on the horse backwards. Yes, that was good too. And I, I like that scene. That's a good scene. That, that that's but that's classic swashbuckling. That's classic western, classic serial type stuff. Which is one of the my favorite parts about this this film is mm-hmm. is the swashbuckler aspect. And you don't really see that very often anymore. And that might be another reason this movie is forgotten. I'm trying, you to think, say, like, I'm trying to think about a movie that's now that's like this. Pirates is the only thing I can think of. And that's high fantasy. That's like maybe Lone Ranger. But I mean, he doesn't really use it's not really a sword fighting kind of. I'd give you the right? first Pirates was, was like that. It was a little less fantasy. And then it goes really goes off it the dark. rail. It gets, it gets yeah. dark and not even so much darkness, but just the type of action. Mm-hmm. It's a little less swashbuckly, a little more mm-hmm. just fantasy. Yeah. Adventure at that point. Well, every a lot of a lot of action stuff, a lot of adventure stuff nowadays is, is darker like we were just having a conversation about jurassic the differences between jurassic world franchise and the jurassic park franchise which i'm separating them i'm not putting them together as i told my son who was asking me about jurassic park today he's like what, what was jurassic park one when was that made and i'm like 93 and he's like when was the second one made i go 97 he's like when was the third one made? And i said i think i guess like 2001 and he's like when was the fourth one made? i go stop <laughs> <laughs> there is no fourth Jurassic Park. There's Jurassic World, which is not good. He's like, it's not good. I go, it's not good. Oh, uh, it's it's no. not bad. Butler, You're Butler. S- it's Jurassic World is basically Jurassic Park. That's it's uh, the same movie. Okay. No, I guarantee you showed your son that. Your listen, son's what I'm, seven. Listen, I'm, I'm your son would love Jurassic World. 
I'm sure he would love it, yeah. but it's not as good as Jurassic Park. It's not, it's, and he's young. He doesn't know anything. Young kids are dumb. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Need I remind you, you liked Sphere before we talked about it. That's right. Yeah. Bow I got your, nothing. I got bow nothing. your goddamn head. <laughs> Spirit isn't fun though, and it's not dinosaurs. Listen, <laughs> I, I, we're, we're, ta- I'm talking in, we're in jest, and I'm talking. If right. you like a movie, that's great. You like a movie. Movies are subjective. <laughs> it's fine. I'm, I'm right, and I am wrong, and you are right, and you are wrong. It's just how I it think is. We both agree. Sphere is not great. It's just Sphere is two different movies, but we're not talking about Sphere. We're talking about <laughs> Mask of Sorrow. Um, oh, I had something that. I, oh, okay. So we're talking about Aaron Campbell. Okay. We're talking about the Bond movies. The movie at the song at the end. At the end credits, when the Mark Anthony oh, yep. song comes on, I don't remember who he's singing with. Um, like, I felt like I was watching a Bond movie. Like, because then all of a sudden, like, it just. Da, 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 da. And then there was like all these like fireballs, and as the credits are going, I think that's kind of very indicative of action movies in the '90s uh, to have that kind of love theme. Play that's fair. Yeah. Not not just so even so much James Bond, and the, like the fireballs and the credits. That's also very much like adventure movies back then. Like, look at the Mummy has like the same thing as you scroll. You've got that background and sure. stuff. I think Congo has that at the end of Congo, the Temple Walls, I believe, in the credit sequence. I can't. Oh, really con- oh my god, just Congo? Yeah, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just <sighs> saying it's got. I think it's got the temple thing in the background. I don't remember. The only thing I remember is Bruce Campbell getting his head smashed. <laughs> I remember. I remember sign, the same the same sign language uh, that the ape is doing for this all the same words. Apple? Apple, 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 hello, Apple. help. And it's always the same <laughs> movement. I remember that. <laughs> Back to Zorro. I, 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 say, I've, I've, I believe we've gone off topic. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about how Zorro drinks out of the gla- out of the out of the jug of his, oh, of his right? brother's That's head. That's gross. That's real. That's based on this guy did that. So the Captain Harrison Love did that, apparently. Like ah. he kept he kept the because in the legend, the three fingered Pete is actually he's not a white guy. He's not an old white guy. He's, uh, uh, I think he's. Mexican three finger Jack. I actually knew I Jack or Pete. I have three fingered Pete. Ooh, what do you have, Jack? I thought I had Jack. I think it's three fingered Pete. I'm looking at IMDb right now. It's three fingered. It's three finger Jack. Jack. Yeah. I have Pete down here. You are wrong. Okay, but anyways, go ahead. I was gonna say his name is LQ Jones, so his real name isn't even Pete. But I did know that he was based on a real character. Yeah. So like, but he did keep the head of Joaquin Marietta and three finger Jack (laughs) in uh. Now, I don't know if he drank out of them. I think he might have, because isn't he He's... also the inspiration for the film Ravenous? I don't know. I thought he was like the okay. fact that he thought he would get their like strength because he's drinking it. Yeah. I but think he might. I think been. it was gross that Zorro drank it. Here's what I think is kind of weird and gross. What's he keeping the head in? Because water, this is supposed to be months, a year yeah. of training before he's at this point now. So his brother's been dead for a long time, and that head's just been kept in water, and is that preserved? Well, there'd be pieces of it floating around. Exactly. That, yeah, yeah, no. yeah, it's yeah, it's that, gross. that'd be deteriorated. It's by gross. The water. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's disgusting. And I wouldn't drink. I don't know. Drinking out of it to be tough. Uh, uh, gross. I know it's a movie, but it's still disgusting. It's gross. I mean, it's also a very memorable scene, but yeah, it's disgusting. <laughs> so one of the other things I don't like. Okay. Is two things. Bring it up. <laughs> One is the unnecessary cleavage shot that they give you, which comes before the scene when he has the fight with Elena. Okay. So he runs up the stairs and then all of a sudden she comes around the corner and it's like looking down and she's got like this dress on. It's just like. <sighs> oh, when she kind of looks. And yeah. Of- it's like, come on. <laughs> but that's also that that shot. Is that is- part of, are you going to tell me that's part of swashbuckling adventure? Yes. It's a, that's oh, like the romantic oh, shot they do on. for the, the, the female lead. They always do that. What? And all. Go back and watch it's all those old films. It's a little gratuitous. Eh, it's what it, it, put, it puts asses in seats. I, I, I understand that. It's a little gratuitous. Yeah. And I don't like the scene when he cuts her clothes off. Not because of, oh, he cuts her clothes off. Because it looks so stupid <laughs> when they pull them off. It- Do you surrender? Never. But I may scream. I understand. Sometimes I have that effect. I was going through the research and it was like, did you know that the scene when they her clothes came off were pulled by strings? Yeah, no oh, shit. No. no shit. They were pulled by strings. You, everyone could tell you that. They're probably Velcroed together. Yeah. And pulled down by. You mean they wire. didn't just fall off? It, like when her whole body shakes when they like, I can just picture like eight guys sitting there like, OK, ready in action. <laughs> just the execution of that was just kind of like, oh, come on. And 
but that, that I guess that I get you could say that's a nitpick. I just was not a fan of that. I thought it was funny. Of course you did. You're what are you? Uh, 15 when this came out. So you probably were like, like oh, 11, yeah, 11, 11. Yeah. Gross. Yeah, I, I like, know what you did when yeah. you went home. <laughs> 11. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what kids do anymore. <laughs> So that's it. You have nothing else you don't like about it. You love everything about this movie. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I really like there's a reason I put this on the list, man. I I really like this film. I think this is the last great swashbuckling film. I think the sequel came too late, was not well done. It was a huge disappointment to me because I love this film so much. Growing up, I always loved Zorro, too, which helps. Public domain character now. Or it was back then, too. So you can do your own Zorro. Oh, that's great. Uh, do you think they'll accept me as Zorro? I think Blonde so, Blonde-haired white guy? Yeah, I yeah, think so. Just yeah, just speak in a Welsh well. accent. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I think I grew up, because Disney Channel back then was a good channel. It actually had, like, older Aww. stuff and classic stuff. Yeah, it's not good anymore. I, uh, Disney, I like your stuff. Listen, Disney. I'm sure Disney Plus will be great. Maybe it'll be on there. Maybe. That'd this be is, cool. This is a touchstone movie, right? No. This is because no, he's not. public domain. This is um, TriStar. Right. You're right. I'm sorry. You're right. Um, but I think Disney owns the original series. So I used to watch those on the Disney Channel. And then I had a, um, you know, growing up, I was really little. I had a VHS of Disney sing-alongs. And the Zorro theme was always one of those. It was a montage of all his fighting. So okay. I always liked Zorro growing up when this movie came out. I'd like to hear some bars of that if you know it. Out of the night when the full moon is bright. That's it? Comes a horseman known as Zorro. Zorro! <laughs> <laughs> Um, ah, there's well, more to it. I can't remember. A, please stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that's public domain, so I can't put that at the end credits. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> I could do my rendition of it. <laughs> well, so at the ending, I'll give you some. I'll give you something else. That Go ahead I, and I give me question. what you don't like. About I'm not saying you I don't like it, but I have a question. Bitch. So, like at the end of the movie, that we've got to save all the people in the mine. We got to make sure the mine. He wants to blow up the mine. Let's stop that. He's got to blow up the mine. He's going to kill all these people. He's going to kill all these people. So Zoro's fighting all these people at the mine. So he's like, oh, shoot. He gets into the boiler room. I'm going to turn the heat up in the boiler room because I'm going to blow up this mine. The people are still locked up. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, so the mine blows and the people are down there screaming. And he's like yelling, Alina, save the people. She should be like, you did this. Well, they still had the dynamite. The dynamite was still going. No, I get that. But he still, you know, caused the fire that is going to. He's the one that caused the fire. That's going to burn these people unless Elena gets out of, gets out them of out the of the, the cages that they're locked into. I'm just, what, what do you say to that? I don't think that's accurate. That's not, a, he, he's, he's fighting these guys. He's having the sword fight. Right. He falls. He gets into the room with the boiler and they're all like going to surround him. So he turns the boiler up so that it'll blow up and it'll get all these people. He gets out of there, kills all the guys that are going after him. I don't think that's what restarts the fire on the that, line. No, that's what, that's what ignites the entire mine. All They've the wood. Already, the people, Jack starts the fire on the on the he, explosive line. It gets cut, but then it catches on fire. Again. It catches on fire again because he blows up. Is the that what the, yes. is that what catches on fire? Yes, the, second the time? fire fire comes down off of the, the boiler that he explodes off. A piece of wood comes down and ignites the yeah, well, thing. I again. don't think he knew it was going to ignite you the line again. Forgetting pieces of the movie here. <laughs> It's like he knows it's going to reignite the line. Oh, it's going to hit perfectly and hit the line. If you're going to have an explosion, <laughs> if you're going to cause something to explode and it's going to cause this entire wooden structured mine <laughs> to catch on fire, you don't think that it's going to get down to the people that are in wooden cages? They're metal cages. The, the bars are metal, but they're in giant wooden cages. Yeah. What are you, eh, you're, 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 you're making excuses now. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now that Zorro had, has put these kid, people's lives in danger. And you're like, eh, Zoro's a villain, not a hero. <laughs> He's wearing all black, black. You know, it's usually like, like, like Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> like, you know, like what? Not Empire Strikes Back, but Star Wars with Darth Vader's all in black. He's a villain. Darth Vader's just misunderstood. What do you say to that? <laughs> I'm just saying he burned those people up. Or he tried to. <laughs> what else you got? What else you got? As, in terms of dislikes? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Let me go through my notes here. Yeah. Um, that was it. That's all I had. Oh, well, nah. Eh. When old Zoro, as I've called him now, uh, <laughs> lights the hill on fire with the big Z, like yeah. he's not that far away. And, I, I and thought he's standing the there. He's like it's standing like, there to get the horses. Yeah, he's like he's right there. Can you not tell it's Bernardo? <laughs> <laughs> when he goes and like he's gonna have, wants to fight. And when I say he, I mean uh, Don De La Vega goes to fight Don Raphael mm -hmm. and basically tell her, tell you know what's Yo, who you, know, you are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like, why are you doing this? 
And I was like, I was starting to like get cynical, like not cynical, but critical of the fact that, okay, so now you're just going to take yourself out of play. You're just going to go there. You're going to fight. You think he's going to fight, but then you get captured. What's the point of this? What's the point of this? But then I'm like, you know what? It's a human, it's a human trait. It's a human emotion to just kind of like finally face him. Want the truth out. Right. Who are you? I warned you long ago, Raphael, that you would never be rid of me. Raphael, you were not the Zorro I saw last night. That was your master, Don Alejandro. Yes. But there are many who would proudly wear the mask of Zorro. So I, I, I understood that scene. And that's kind of like even beforehand, Antonio Banderas is saying the same thing. You're telling me I shouldn't go after revenge. And, right. and then you are. And it's like, well, you've been trained. You're Zorro now. You're better than like he, he knows that what he's doing is stupid and wrong. But it's just, yeah, like you said, it's like. This is why I escaped from prison. I'm glad I made a new Zorro. Yeah. But this is this is my reason for being. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. I, I hear you. No, I, I I know I'm being I know I'm a, I'm attacking you and your love for this for this. Listen, that's fine. Yeah, I know I'm attacking you and your love for this, but I, it, I enjoyed this movie. I thought it was funny. I thought the moments were funny. I really like Banderas in this movie. Me? Uh, a a gentleman? Lot. This is going to take a lot of work. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, I like the action set pieces, and I like that a lot of it was there was a lot of practical effects. Well, yeah, you know, like that kind it's of. It's Martin Campbell's kind of mo, right? But also that, like, you know, the horse, the horse scene when they're fighting, even in the mine, that whole the whole structure's built up and stuff like that. And I just, think that might be why I like Swashbuckler so much. Is is it's so real? Much is more real? Yeah, you don't want to. You can't like fake the sword fighting. You can fake angles and make. All right, it's stunt doubles doing it, so you can't tell. Which clearly in this one, it is Antonio Banderas for most of it. Um. But other than that, even then, you still appreciate it for the stunt work that it is. Mm-hmm. You know, John Wick, you appreciate it for the stunt work. You 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 like to see actual people. I'm not saying putting themselves in danger, but doing incredible things on camera. Well, stuntmen, they they're doing dangerous stuff. They're doing dangerous stunts to pardon the pun, but it's all within safety regulations. They're they're perf- they're they're professionals at that. Right. They know how to roll. They know how to fall appropriately. They know how to like you know get what they need to do in the shot and make sure they don't get hurt. Right. So, I mean, that there's an art to that. And, Absolutely. And I think that I, w- I wonder if CGI and the onslaught of everything being done in post and, you know, I wonder if that has affected uh, the workforce for stunt people and for stunts. You know, I, I wonder if like, because there's not as many movies that are requiring stunts or, you know, like... I don't know. I don't know because there's also so much more television now. True. That they probably just aren't doing as many big things. But maybe maybe that's work. it. Maybe maybe there's not a there's not there's no more pushing of the envelope. I don't know. I, I'm I'm really just asking. I think there are certain films where obviously envelope still gets pushed. I think you know casino like not casino out James Bond films. Mm-hmm. You always hear about oh so and so getting injured on set. Half the time it is Daniel Craig himself. <laughs> but they're they're still pushing the envelope. Tom Cruise. Um, Tom Cruise. I mean the Aston Martin scene in. Quantum of Solace when they're going across the small roads. The Aston Martin flipped over. The guy died, unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, which is very sad. But that's because they pushed the envelope. Sure. Because they still, you know, go, what's going to excite the audience next? What's the next big thing? When they did Casino Royale, they flipped the Aston Martin 12 times when mm-hmm. he um, avoids Ava Green. And he just flips, 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 flips. Right. There was right. a stunt guy in that car. But Ava Green's not on the road. Is she on the road or there's a stunt woman on the road? It's a stunt woman on the oh, road. Oh, really? So they actually have him flip over the person? They, it doesn't flip over when it's as close and obviously goes off on a ramp. Sure. But there is a person there. Oh, that's yeah. cool. I like that. I mean, I think also I would think as a filmmaker, it's more exciting to or more I don't know, engaging to shoot a scene like that because it's there. It's in front of you. It's tangible. Oh, you're absolutely. not you're not like, okay, and cut and we're gonna put all that stuff later on in post. Good job, guys. React and we're done. Look, right. Tennis ball, good to go. It says something that in the scene where he's on the two horses in Zorro and he he jumps backwards, he's standing, he's standing on two horses. Now he's probably supported on something. Of course. But the shot doesn't just show the tops of horse backs. Right. So it's like, oh well he's clearly on yeah. fake horses on a tro like no, let's show half their legs to show this is a real guy standing on real horses. Yeah, it's a double appreciation of that scene because it's an appreciation right. of the fact that, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. But also somebody really did this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's like in, when we, in our, one of our last episodes, early episodes, Wanted, when the car 
the when he's in the parking lot, Wes is oh, in the, the parking lot, the car him scoops up. him up. Like that was a that was a real that was a practical yeah, thing. right, which is appreciative. Yeah, which I mean, the first time I saw it, I didn't know I thought it was CG. Mm-hmm. Then watching the documentary, I was like, oh wow, they they scooped that guy up. Right. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, and I mean the sword fighting is really cool in this. The sword fighting is really well done, mm-hmm. really fast. It's clearly the actual actors doing it. When he's fighting Captain Love after he steals the map. And he's fighting him and he gives him the sword back and they're both fighting. And then he gets his goon friend and Antonio Banderas is fighting two swords at a time. That's really impressive. Well, what I had read was that Banderas was trained by the, the same man who trained Errol Flynn, uh, who did oh, all his awesome. stunts. Yeah. But also Banderas was working with the, uh, I think the Spanish or Mexican fencing team for like four months. But the guy that trained Banderas said that he's, he was like one of the best swords swordsman he's ever seen like he did so much he trained so hard for this that he just he became someone who was really really well adept at sword fighting so, absolutely and that's yeah. really impressive i like that yeah absolutely that's kind of like um who's in uh, la la land ryan ryan gosling ryan gosling learned how to play piano and now he's like somebody who can play piano like a professional you know like that's, he, yeah that's pretty cool yeah absolutely I like people that put the work into it like that well it's tough when you get older it's tough to pick up skills. It's tough to because I'm not saying that your 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 brain is not as spongy as right. it yeah, was when you're you were not, a kid. You're not, yeah, right. So it's tough. Like if I said like, "Hey, I want to learn how to play guitar," it would take me longer to do it. Absolutely, because it's not be, just because I have so many things hardwired into my brain. It's, it's science, Butler. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I'm not no. disagreeing. So you're... it's it's impressive when when at the older you get, when you learn new skills, it's it's very impressive that yeah. you know you're able to master them. But again. I think Banderas is perfectly cast in this role, and I think he plays Zoro perfectly. I mean, he's like, there's nobody, I can't see anybody else as him. No. And unless you do like, you know, the return of Zoro or whatever it's called, and Banderas turns, becomes the De La Vega character, I think you have to have his wife pass away. I don't think Captain Zeta Jones should be in the movie. I think it should just uh, be him. No, I think it should just yeah. be him. Maybe he's, he's like, doesn't speak to his kids anymore. Like he becomes, you know, more Batman y than right. Well, like, so di- like a dis such a disconnect. Right. Something happens where they, they don't they don't need they don't want Zoro anymore. The people don't want Zoro anymore, or they, you know I what I mean. That. Well, what what works with that is if you continue that story, because I know the reboot they wanted to do with I believe Guy Gael Garcia, um, is it Guy Garcia Gael? Uh, either way, he was supposed to be cast as Zoro, and I don't know if that's still true or not because it's been about ten years since they cast him. Sure, uh, it was supposed to take place in the modern age. Oh, now it's supposed to take place now. Mm. I, I don't like that because you're not mm. going to get as much swashbuckling. It's not going to be the same, but you can almost kind of do a little bit of that because you're getting more into the modern age. Mm-hmm. And now you can kind of say, all right, now this exists and this exists. Do you still need Zorro in a time where maybe the Dons don't have as much power now, mm-hmm. or you are the United States and he's in California and it's like, well, the Dons don't have power. People can vote, blah, blah, blah. What's he, mm-hmm. what's he fighting for? What's he needed for? Yeah. You don't have to find that. Right. I mean, I, I I don't want them to do like a like a Logan type Zoro movie where it's like, you know, no, no, he should be passing the torch. Right. Yeah. It should be swashbuckling. But like also placing it in like the time period that this is in. It makes it timeless so anybody can watch it because it's not dated. If you put it in modern age, yeah. you're like, uh, that's the time. period. yeah, right. You well, know? That's one of the things I do like about this film, which is actually a note is that. I could show this to you now and it still does look. The what I have on Blu-ray looks still looks pretty good, looks pretty clean. I show that to somebody. My oh, when was that made? Like ten years ago? It's like no, nah, twenty years ago. Yeah, but I think that's that's, that's part of that. Yeah, it's like indicative of that timelessness. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not putting the CG. It's it's practical, so mm-hmm. it's nothing. Uh, that's that, I think that helps too. Yep, absolutely. Because when I think as much as you know, CGI and computer effects are great. If you know, sometimes they date your movie. Yep, and, and you you're just kind of like an alien. Like Alien Three, like I don't mind Alien Three, but the effects in Alien Three date that movie, right? As opposed to Alien or Alien Two, where it's, right. it's people into its practical effects and they right. took the time to do. See, I know that like when you watch when you watch the re releases of Star Wars and Empire and all that stuff, all after all they've added all those effects to there. They've they've you know, right. But if yeah. you watch the originals, you can still see the box around you know the the ships going around in space, like you know the little box that like yeah, pastes the them in there. Right. Right. I mean, you can still see like that. So if they never touched Star Wars and, and they never touched the original trilogy and you kept have, you having them out there now. I mean, it dates the movie, but now that Absolutely, they've gone yeah. back and retouched everything and made everything look great and, you know, it, it doesn't. It makes it more timeless, which is 
which is great. You know what? That's what CGI should be used for to kind of clean up stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah, not I to agree, add yeah. stuff, not to make uh, Greedo shoe first and stuff like that, but, or but just, to, first, just to clean me. stuff up. So if, right. when you show your, like Star Wars is a great film. So when you show your kids, they're not saying, yeah. oh, look at this old piece of crap. That. Yeah. The strings, right? There. I can <laughs> see them. They're just a jerk. <laughs> it's really a model. <laughs> 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 I'd rather watch The Last Jedi and then Butler throws, throws something through the wall. Oh, then uh, my child. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Now. Daddy, The Last Jedi is my you favorite. Would never Listen, do that. Uh, I don't know. The Last mm-hmm. Jedi. I mean, if they can say episode one's my favorite, I get it. There's a lot of kid stuff in Yippee. there. But Last Jedi is dark, depressing, and slow. Hey. So I, well, I'd have to bring so my kids dress to the Fallen Kingdom. Maybe. Exactly. I like when the Brachiosaurus dies, you go into a second. Nobody likes that. <laughs> All right, we've gone off topic again. Yes, we have. All right, so I know we talked about how we're not going to ever ask if people should revisit, so we're not going to do that now, even though I put that in the opening. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, it's good. It's fun. Watch it. I really like this movie. You don't see movies like this anymore. I do want to watch The Legend of Zorro again, just to kind of see it, because mm-hmm. I watched this I one. I can see that, yeah. Just to kind of like complete it, as uh, one of our friends from uh, Andrew Morgan from the Nomcast says, uh, he's a completist. I think uh, I am too. Started, a yeah, bit. So we yeah. have to watch the rest of House Party series. Yeah, I mean, this movie really has this timeless feel, like we just said. Sure. You don't see, I, I can't, I'm, Pirates, like we said, we, I can't remember a movie that's like this. So it's like, it's tough to find a movie like this mm-hmm. that's not going back all the way to like Errol Flynn and the Robin Hoods and the. Uh, like those. now? Like now, no, yeah. You have right. to go back a long time. No, you're right. There is. Yeah, there, Even is, in the 80s. I mean, it's, it's. Well, you see, you can make the argument that like Raiders is more of like swashbuckling, like that, that kind of series. It's an adventure. It's a serial. Right, it's an adventure kind of serial, a, but it's not a swashbuckler. Well, like you're talking about like Cutthroat Island. I'm talking, yeah, swords, the pirates, and, and you know, yeah, you're not, you're fighting a guy hand to hand with him. There's no guns. There's no, or there's not mm-hmm. really that much guns. I understand, stuff like that. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, no, I hear you, but you gotta also do it right. If it's not done right, Phantom's like that. Phantom though has the gun. It's, Phantom. Yeah, we Phantom's about that not great. Bit. Phantom yeah. is flawed, but. But it's like I'm saying it's, it's like, like that. Yes, yeah. it's more yeah. swashbuckling. Yeah, I guess Hook's a swashbuckler, but more for kids. Uh, yeah, you could say maybe you can make the saying that maybe Star Wars is a little bit of one. Mm, I don't certain, know if I can make that because well, like you talked about the you're talking about early start like the original trilogy. Uh, I'm talking about early trilogy. Not not the prequels probably yeah, okay. wouldn't be considered or the newer trilogy. Okay, but the prequels might be considered that way. So I know some of the sword fighting stuffs inspired by Errol Flynn. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's a movie that you don't see. And Tony Banderas is great. Yep. Like you said, it's high energy. He really puts yep. everything into it. It's like controlled aggression in his acting. Yeah, I would say so. Well, which which works because his character is just so the death of his well, brother. He's, all, he's, he's angry. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And he's very charismatic <laughs> once he becomes Zorro and charming. And I mean, that's Banderas to a T. So yeah. absolutely. Yep. James Horner's score. I think this is one of his best scores. It's up there. Definitely. Well, the, the score is from the song, too. Right. Because that song is off of the you hear it in the movie. Right, which right. he no, yeah, 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 he was a song. Yeah, yeah, song. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. But I think his score in this film is, is one of the most memorable things to me. Like you can, it's a it's a song that you can whistle or hum or or sing to yourself, like hum to yourself while you're if you, like if you heard it, if you heard you it, know right? It's Mask of Zorro. And I think that's indicative of really good themes with Star Wars and mm-hmm. you know Indiana Jones, of and course. Stuff like that um, there are very few films that have memorable theme songs anymore, and I think that's one of the Harry Potter stuff to me. Well, it's John Williams. Oh, okay. I'm just <laughs> Inside Out has a theme I, I always remember. I don't remember it. Really? I remember Wally's theme. Yep. I can't I can't remember Inside Out's theme. I understand your point. But yeah, it's it's just a really good score and it's something that you don't see a lot or very often anymore in a lot of movies. Um so I think that's good. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I gush because I love uh, that's fine. I love this film. That's fine. I, I'm I don't not like it. I enjoyed it. I got you. All right, we've come to the time when we talk about other things we do. But I'm going to plug this. So yes. <laughs> everyone listening, please share with your friends. If you think that we actually are kind of cool to listen to or maybe cool to make fun of uh, to your friends, please share. Let everyone know, you know, the that they can get us. Yeah, that they can hear us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, Spotify. Or Google Play. Or if you want to just go to our website, ForgottenCinemaPodcast.com. Uh, you know, every time we post an episode, I have all the links to all those other portals out there. So you don't have to go to, you know, go searching for it. It's one stop shopping. And then uh, hit us up. Let us know if uh, if we're doing something wrong, if we're doing something good. If you, what you like about the cast, you know, if there's certain things you want us to talk about more. If you want to talk about a certain movie suggested, we'll give you a shout out when we do. We've gotten a couple of suggestions from people. We haven't done them yet, but you'll be first to know because we'll, 
talk about how these are suggestions. It has been added to the list. They have been added to the giant (laughs) growing list of movies that we have to get to. And uh, yeah, so that was it. I just wanted to kind of give a quick uh, plug to what we're doing right now. Go ahead, Mike. All right. I've got two other podcasts I do. I've got Cracking One Open with Mike and Elise, where we talk about brews, news, and pop culture reviews. Every episode, we crack open a new local craft beer. We talk a little bit about the brewery and the history of it, the type of beer, the style, the flavor, and a little bit about the bottle art, because I think that's just as important nowadays in terms of getting your brand across. And while we're uh, sipping on our brew, we go over the latest in pop culture news, usually um, not so much gossip, but you know what's on Netflix, Hulu, HBO, what's in the theaters now. So if you're interested in hearing me talk about more modern uh, releases, that's where I would talk about them. So that is Cracking One Open with Mike and Elise that I do with my fiance. I've also got Two Player Bros that I do with my brother Alex, where we're two uh, brothers who play way too many video games, and we talk about all things video game related, Xbox, PlayStation, PC, VR. So if you want to hear me talk about the latest in video games and my brother, who's quite the tech whiz, uh, head over and listen to Two Player Bros. So that's what I got going on, This those two podcasts for now. Well done. Well Thank done. Thank you. Also, I should. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our summer slate of movies because this is the last one oh, for the summer. Is. We wanted to. I kind of wanted to let everyone know that um, we're not stopping, but in October, we're going to be doing specifically horror movies for ho- forgotten horror films for the month of October. And we'll see you next week when we'll be talking about the Sugarland Express. Well, I will just simply gush over Steven Spielberg and how much I love him as a filmmaker, and I will not apologize for that. Say you're sorry. I apologize. So that's starring <laughs> Goldie Hawn, uh, William Atherton, and Ben Johnson, uh, and Michael Sachs. Uh, that we're going to be watching. That's from 1974. It's an older movie, but you should be able to find it. Uh, so give it a watch before you give us a listen. Oh, that's a nice tag. I like that. The Sugarland Express next week. Um, I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And this is Forgotten Cinema. <laughs>